Hey y'all, welcome back to the channel. It's another video, another day. Um, today, I just wanna come and tell you guys a little bit about my testimony. Uh, my journey with God, you know, how I, where I started to where I'm at now. Just a little bit about it, my testimony. Um, and I hope that it blesses you. I hope that you can uh, take something from it. I hope that um, it's not just an interesting story or whatever, but that you can hear the spirit of God through it and um, see, you know, what God has done for me. He can do for anybody. He can do it for you um, or for people who you may be praying for that they that they get saved or anything like that. So um, I guess I'll take you guys back. Um Growing up, I grew up in the church um, my whole life. I was born and raised in the church. Um, and I was born in Illinois and then moved to Minnesota where I am at now when I was about eight years old. Um, but when I was in Illinois, I was, you know, the, the little kid that would uh, love, you know, just I had, had a love for God kind of thing. Like I would have my little kids Bible. I'll be using it. I'll be preaching David and Goliath stories or sermons. And I would, you know, be involved in, uh, children's, uh, choir, children's church, um, being part of like little plays that the church would put on. And I enjoyed it. I was, I, it wasn't like a thing that I was forced to do. It was a thing that I, I had enjoyment for and a love for it. Um, but then I would say things changed and shifted uh, moving to Minnesota, you know, moving to Minnesota was not something that I wanted to happen in my life. Um, and, uh, we moved to Minnesota. Um, my family did so that my dad could start a church. Uh, my, uh, dad was called to start a ministry here in Minnesota. So moving to Minnesota, it was, you know, to me at that age, it was, it was really hard. Um, and it affected me a lot, um, growing up. Just because you know I was away from all my you know extended family, uh, my aunts and uncles, cousins, things of that sort, and you know moving to Minnesota, it's a totally different culture and environment and um, just place than Illinois is. In Illinois, it was very diverse. My my school that I went to went to a Christian school, and that Christian school that I went to in Illinois, I enjoyed it. I loved it. It was fun. I didn't have a, a distaste for it. My classmates uh, were cool. Um, diversity in in race. Um, moving to Minnesota wasn't quite the same story. Um, yeah, you know, I went to uh, I went to a school um, in second grade. That was that was like a um, kind of a a charter school. That was a, a an interesting experience because the the people that went to that school, a lot of them, the students, I would say, weren't saved. So that was kind of a culture shock to me. Um, but I didn't I didn't mind the school. Um, but then from third grade on to my senior year of high school, I went to a, a Christian school, and it was hard. It was a culture shock. It was hard um, because. The school that I went to in third grade, I was like one of the first black people that a lot of my classmates ever met. And that came with the whole thing. You know, like I said, in Illinois, the school I went to, there was black, brown, white, Asian, you know, it was cool. It was just, it was diverse. And you know, when you're young, you know, things are new, things are, um, you ask questions, you're not used to certain things. And so, uh, moving to Minnesota, the school I went to, um, I was really one of the first black kids. And that had um, kind of affected my identity. Looking back now, it it messed with my identity. Because then moving forward, as you know, you get older, you start playing sports. Um, you know, for me personally, I played basketball um, in school. And I wasn't, I wouldn't say I'm like super crazy athletic for anybody who watches basketball or knows the NBA, like I would compare my play style to like maybe a James Harden or a, a Paul Pierce, you know, those kind of players who aren't super athletic, 
who aren't going to jump out the gym kind of thing. And they're, those are NBA players. So I'm I'm in high school and, you know, I wasn't dunking or anything like that, but I could shoot the ball and different things like that. Um, and so that kind of came with this whole thing. Like, you know, Blake, you're, you're supposed to carry us. Uh, you're supposed to, you know, be able to dunk. How come I can jump higher than you? You know, these little sly remarks, you know, you're the, you know, the least athletic black guy I know. Um, things like that. The whitest black guy I know. Stuff like that. And I'm thinking, like, for a time, I was the only black guy, you know. You know, in real life. So that kind of fooled with my identity, um, the way I viewed myself. And so then it kind of even affected how I interacted with my family, my extended family. Even when I would go back to Illinois for like holidays, you know, I would get back around, you know, you know, my family, my culture kind of thing. And sometimes not know how to fully interact. And, you know, it was just like I said, one of the things that the Lord really healed me from um, is my identity. Right. And so not only is there that racial undertone, am I am I really the whitest black guy? Am I really not black kind of thing? Like it, it really was a thing and it was subtle. It was sly. Um, you know, it was there was ignorance in it as well. Like I'm sure it wasn't fully malicious coming from the students, at least. But, you know, there were even things coming from certain teachers that um, was racially uh racially wrong let's just put it that way and so then that's one side of things you know being black you know and and kind of having a question about it then when it comes to my love for god that that kind of thing uh kind of died down slowly but surely like the school that i went to wasn't really feeling or seeing the love of god that i felt back in Illinois and then even moving on to um you know my you know the church that my dad started um it was difficult because I didn't have to set up the mics or different things like that um growing up at the church that I went to in Illinois but you know moving to Minnesota I had to do a, me and my sister had to do a lot of different things for the church and it was hard like sometimes you just wanted to be a kid you just wanted to you know, not have to be the one to do certain things. Sometimes you just wanted to be um, a member and and then having that kind of pressure as a pastor's kid to, um, you know, do things perfectly. I never felt really that pressure from my parents, not gonna lie. Um, they didn't really pressure me to be perfect, but it felt sometimes uh, like, you know, this is what we're doing. Like we have to do this. Um, this is the you know the the call that God called us to. So kind of get with the program kind of thing. And I would say, when you think of pastors' kids, you know there are it's like two options usually. Like it's the pastors' kid that grew up in the church and and they had an encounter with God, had an encounter with Christ, and it propelled them through their life and they were on fire. You know, obviously everything, everybody has, you know, different circumstances and situations. Um, but then there's the other side of things where, you know, that, that, that pastor's kid will turn their back on God um, because of the, the pressure or the stigma or just not accepting God for themselves. And I would say, you know, as the time went on in my life in Minnesota, different experiences that I had, I was more so on the side where I wasn't wilding out. I wasn't going crazy. Um, I wasn't, you know, a, 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 a deviant, uh, but I wasn't on fire. I was in the middle. I was very lukewarm. There were times I would call on God and there were times where I would, you know, not really want anything to do with God. And so um, fast forward to college, I went to Liberty University. Um, which is a Christian college for anyone who doesn't know. And I enjoyed my time there, but I wasn't really living for God there. You know, my whole thing going to college was, okay, I'm going to go to college. 
Um, there's going to be more people. It's going to be more diverse. Um, and I'll have different opportunities to do certain things that I wanted to do in high school that I, I wasn't able to do. Um, you know, in high school, I didn't really have any, um, you know, relationships with girls or anything like that. Um, and, you know, that was one of the things that also affected my identity. Like, well, am I not attractive? Am I, you know, ugly? Little things like that, that can feel big. And so in, in college, I'm like, well, I'm about to have a whole new opportunity to meet people, um, meet girls, different things like that. And I wasn't really thinking about school. I wasn't really thinking about, oh, I'm going to a Christian university. It was cool to say to like people who are asking you, you know, where are you going to college or what do you want to do for school or what are you going to major in? I told them those things, but those weren't the things on the forefront of my mind. I was really trying to find acceptance and I was hoping that I would be able to find that in college. And I did. I, I had a, a great uh, core group of friends um, that were similar to me, but that core group of friends that I would consider my brothers and, and even sisters to this day, um, you know, it had to get to a point, like I had to learn like, oh, these are the people that are really for you. There was a time in college where I tried to be friends with people who, you know, were cool, you know, the cool crowd or whatever, but there wasn't really, um, you know, that real friendship, that real vulnerability in those friendships. A lot of it just related to basketball, girls, um, you know, potential parties here and there. That I didn't really go to any parties. Even in college, it's, it, I, I, you know, didn't have that thing that said, okay, go to these parties. And so um, there was a lot of things looking back that the Lord kept me from. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I would say one of the main things that um, happened to me in college, uh, kind of, you know, talking about my identity and everything, um, was I did get in my, you know, my first relationship in college. And that relationship kind of... Um, did a number on me in a sense. It um, did a number on me in terms of just my view of myself, um, exposing me to different things that um, I didn't really have exposure to uh, when it comes to like, you know, lust and perversion and different things like that. And, um, you know, I would say again, I was very lukewarm. There would be times where I would repent, times where I would you know, try to let's lock in and, 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 you know, get in, in the word, focus on God, but it wasn't from a pure place. A lot of it was kind of like that peer pressure that, Hey, I'm at a Christian college. I need to be this kind of way. And, you know, that relationship went on for however long it went. Um, and then at the end, you know, I find out certain things happen in the relationship and, um, that affected that affected my identity even more, you know, uh, to get, to be specific, I got cheated on or whatever. And that affected, uh, my view of myself and my view of women. And so I'm looking at myself like, dang, maybe everything that I experienced in high school was true. These things that, um, you know, these thoughts that I had that I'm ugly or I'm not worth it or that, um, you know, no girls like me. Well, it was proven. That's what my thought process was. So I looked at myself differently. And then I even looked at women differently. Like, you know, you can't really trust them. And so by this time, um, I've graduated college and I'm back in uh, Minnesota. And this is around the year 2020 that I graduated. And this is kind of when I found out about some of those things that happened in my relationship. So now moving to 2021, I'm not saved. <laughs> I'm not saved, still not going what I would consider super crazy, but sin is sin. And so I had, you know, made some new friends um, in Minnesota that, you know, I didn't go to high school with. Um, and I began to get exposed to, you know, different things going out. Um, 
parties, clubs, different stuff like that. And I was at a spot where, you know, I'm like, dang, I've, I've, there were certain things that I wanted to do in my flesh that I didn't do um, just because, you know, I knew it was wrong from, you know, the way I was raised. I didn't uh, have sex, even in my relationship. I didn't party like that. I didn't drink like that in college. I didn't do any of those things for real. I didn't smoke or anything like that. Um, but then when I graduated, something was like, you know what? I didn't do any of these things and I still feel bad. I tried to, I tried to keep God's commands, but I really didn't. Um, so I'm gonna do the opposite. I'm gonna just go to the total opposite. So I was on a mission to, to just experience the world and what it had to offer. And it's funny, God protected me even in that mission, I would say, because I really didn't experience certain things um, like I could have. And so um, I would say one of the main things, like to get to the point of where Jesus encountered me for real, um, or where I had a real encounter with God, I had met this girl um at at this concert um and it was a worldly concert it wasn't of god or anything like that but i met this girl there and it was around halloween it was maybe a month like the beginning of october i would say and something inside of me just said you know i'm finna lose my virginity by halloween i don't care i'm fin i'm i'm going to do that and this girl was in my mind, the target, right? And, you know, as I talk about it now, it's just so crazy where I was at, you know, and I'm so thankful for where God has brought me to. Um, but, you know, I started hanging out with this girl um, for a few weeks and it's getting closer and closer to uh, Halloween, right? And this girl, um, you know, she didn't introduce me to, to smoking or anything like that, but she smoked a lot. And so whenever I would hang out with her, I did I did those things. And um in my mind, I'm like, what am I I really I really wasn't convicted um at that point. And so one day we're hanging out, we hang out and we would go to this park to smoke or whatever. And I pick her up and then we drive to this park and as I'm driving to the park, um, I, I tell her to you know play some music, and she played a song that I had never heard, and I asked her about it, and she was like, "Oh, this is a song that I listen to when I when I fight my demons." Right now, when I was younger, like I was filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, probably my senior year of high school. But at this point now in my life, the Holy Spirit is lying dormant, like it's not being activated. I'm grieving Him at any turn that I can. And but when she said this is a song I listen to to fight my demons, something that like, kind of clicked in my mind like she's being serious, and she actually deals with demons, um, not like you know she wasn't using it in the way that a lot of people use it like, you know just troubles or problems using the word demons for that. It really felt like she was actually talking about real demons. So I just kind of took a mental note of that. We get to the park, we're smoking, we take a break, go to a, a nearby grocery store to grab food, come back to the park to continue. And at this point, she puts on some music and she said it was like her uh, psychedelic playlist. And what's crazy um, is that now where I'm at in my walk and in my faith and just where I'm at with God, I understand how vital the music you listen to is to your spiritual life. You know, music is definitely a gateway to different things. It can open up portals to the enemy and uh, attacks from the enemy, but it also can open up the heavens. Um, it could be a place where as you're praising and worshiping and listening to, to music that glorifies God, he can come in and, and, and edify you. You can worship him and give him honor. So when she puts on this psychedelic playlist, it was like the atmosphere around the park changed. It, uh, changed. And... You know, at this point, we kind of like move over to the swings. We were at a at a park bench, and then we decided to go swing while smoking. 
Now, this is where the story gets a little bit crazy or unbelievable for some people. But this is what I experienced. We get on the swing. And as we're swinging, I literally feel this dark presence uh, like come upon me almost. And in, in, in my spirit, I could tell it introduced itself to me. Like it gave me its name. And it was a demonic presence. And it pretty much warned me, um, which is weird. I think I think back now, like I feel like the Holy Spirit was definitely protecting me from it. But it was warning me, like, I'm trying to possess you. I'm trying to get you right now. Like you've opened up many doors. You've opened up many doors and, and given many different legal rights. So this is what is about to go down. And I'm thinking, maybe I'm just thinking off you know, maybe I'm tripping off the weed or I'm overthinking what she said earlier. But as I'm thinking these thoughts, I can feel like my, I take my phone out and go to my camera and I put it on my face and I'm looking at myself. I feel like I look normal, right? But when I take the phone out and see my face in the camera, like my eyes are like bugged out, like wide, wide open, but I feel like I look normal. And then this part sounds crazy. As I'm on the swing, I start swinging, but I wasn't really swinging. I wasn't kicking my legs or anything. I was going back and forth on the swing without using any momentum. And so when I realized this is actually happening, I kind of got whatever strength I had left in my mind or in my body to stop myself from swinging. And then I tell this girl, hey, I'm a Christian and I think um, something, you know, a demonic presence is trying to get me, which is nuts. I, I'm saying I'm a Christian, but have lived a life contrary to that for, for at least two, three years where I'm literally not living for God. But now that I'm in this warfare, I'm proclaiming to be a Christian and it's, it's amazing. And I'm thankful that, you know, God was there through it all and that he, um, you know, died for me while I was yet a sinner and, you know, that his grace was there. So I get off the swing. I tell her this whole thing. This is what I'm thinking is happening. I call my dad and I'm like, dad, this is what I think is going on. This is what I feel is happening. And, um, like we begin to pray on the phone. My dad was shocked. He was like, what's going on? Like, how, what did you get yourself into? But I'm like, this, this is not really the time for that right now. Like something's happening. So I'm praying, he's praying. And then I get to this point where I feel the presence kind of leave. If, if that makes sense to anybody watching, I feel the presence kind of leave. And then I feel, um, I, I begin to talk and declare certain things which I really truly believe was the Holy Spirit speaking through me. And he basically said through my mouth um, that, you know, I had to use this experience to get you back on track because you've gone off track, you've gone off the rails too much, and it was going to get to a point that nothing else would have got your attention. No wisdom from your parents, no advice from your friends who are of God, no, um, like I was numb. I was numb to the spirit's convictions. So he said he had to use this to get me back on track. And that through this and through the journey that we would then go on, um, as a true believer and with true surrender, he was going to use me to share the gospel, spread the gospel. And, um, he said that was the time the Holy Spirit spoke to me through that moment. So I'm like, okay, this is crazy. This is crazy. So then I go back over to the girl because she was still over by the swings. And I had walked a, a few a few uh, yards or meters or however far away to kind of war in the spirit. And so then I'm going to walk back to tell her and try to explain to her what I felt and what was going on. And as I'm walking towards her, I stop a few feet away from her and I look up at her. And when I look at her face, it starts to contort. And when I saw the contortion, I kind of looked at her like this, like, 
And then when she saw me make that face, she was like, what? I didn't even do anything to you. And the moment she did that, I knew something was off. I felt in my spirit like this girl knew what was going on and that this girl was sent on assignment to me. And um, I looked at her and then when she got uh, kind of aggressive or defensive, I felt like a tug. I felt like I literally felt a pulling of the spirit away from her to the car that was parked. This experience was so crazy and so supernatural that I left this girl in the park. I ran to the car and drove home. And I was about 35, 40 minutes away from home. So this experience was real to the point where I left this girl in the park. I would never do that under any other circumstances. I would never leave a girl in the park that I had picked up from her house. I would never have done that, but I, I did. <laughs> and the, at this moment, I feel that presence come back. By this time I was off the phone with my dad, I call my dad again when I get in the car and I tell you, I was not fully there. I was kind of, uh, I was not there. Like I was not aware fully. I could tell I was in a battle. I could tell I was in a battle. So even to dial my dad's number was hard. To turn the key in the ignition to start the car was hard, let alone driving on the highway. And I felt like the presence came back like, N oh, hold on, let me backtrack. Before I even get in the car, as I'm running to the car, I hear the girl say, man, I can't believe he figured it out. Huh? F figure what out? That that you were, I, cause I called my dad, the first thing I said when I called my dad and I got in the car, I was like, dad, I think this girl was a witch sent on assignment. Cause <laughs> it's crazy now that I think about it, but that happened. So now I'm in the car, I feel the presence coming back and, and it felt like, oh no, you're not gonna get away with this. You're not gonna get away with this. So I'm, it's literally a battle between light and dark. My dad's on the phone interceding. I'm driving. I don't really remember the drive. I really don't. I know that I got home safely by the grace of God, but I don't really fully remember the drive. And my dad told me that, you know, I began to speak in tongues. I began to prophesy certain things over my life. I was rebuking the devil. I don't remember any of that. This is what my dad told me when I got home. So that supernatural encounter and experience happened. So you would say, oh, well, you fully surrendered to God. I didn't. <laughs> I chilled. I I um, got back on track to an extent after this. What's crazy is I began to have dreams where I'm actually casting out demons. And for the, for the longest... I was angry at those dreams. I'm like, why am I having these dreams? Why am I having these dreams? And it, you know, as time went on, the Lord was revealing certain things that he's gonna use me in that kind of ministry. But to say that I got back on track right away and that I fully surrendered my life to Christ right after that experience would not be true. I would say that he was my savior at, after that experience, but he he didn't become my Lord until just, you know, in the past year and a half, I would say. And, you know, after that the, after that encounter, you know, I, I, I began to go back to church. I began to try to seek God for myself, but part of me was angry with God because I felt like he um, scared me back to him or he um kind of force me because what 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 i'm gonna do i encounter a demon and i see the true real effects of it i'm gonna continue to live the way that i'm living no but i didn't really fully in my heart posture i didn't want to come to god i didn't i was angry at god for allowing me to 
you know, go through some of the things I went through. And I, I'm not going to sit here and say that my testimony or the things that I've experienced in my life were worse than the next person's. You know, a lot of the things I experienced were more internal things as opposed to external circumstances that cause internal things. But my testimony, one thing that the Lord had to show me is that my testimony does matter. Like, I don't have the testimony where I, I came from, you know, you know, the trenches and I, I was selling dope and I was in the streets and I, you know, almost dodged, I had to dodge, you know, bullets here and there. But in reality, my testimony is kind of like that because anytime you're not in Christ, you're susceptible to all those things. And it's only by the grace of God that you don't go through some of those things. So, you know, like I said, I was angry at, at, a, at a point like God, Honestly, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be seeking you right now because I'm angry at you because I feel like you allowed some of the things. I feel like you allowed me to go through those identity issues um, from, from you know, my schooling to then my relationship. And, and I'm supposed to forgive. That was my heart posture. All this stuff happened to me and now I'm supposed to forgive. And, you know, the Lord did a work. He's it's it was a gradual process it was a journey that's one thing that i want to encourage everybody and want everybody to understand that your walk with god is a walk like you're not it's you're not going to get it all right away you give your life to christ that honestly that's um the first step the first step is to get saved but then when you get saved the enemy's mad he's going to send things your way he's going to send temptation your way he's going to send friends your way who aren't living for God, he's going to send uh, old habits back. That's when you have to press in uh, and, and, and acknowledge God as your savior. God has already saved you from these things. But when you make him your Lord, when you make God your Lord, it's now almost, it's, it's on you at this point kind of thing. Like he gives you the grace to now say no to those things say no to those bad habits you know when you first start out in in salvation a lot of times you don't have the power you don't have the power to stop certain things but when you know the holy when you're filled with the holy spirit that's when he gives you the power to say no or to say yes um to other things that you may not want to say yes to so i you know i think i want people to understand the difference between you know, Jesus as your Savior and Jesus as your Lord. Jesus has already saved all of us from anything that could come against us. He's already saved us from it. But to experience that salvation, and let me backtrack a little bit. He saved us, right? So that we can make it to heaven, right? That's amazing. But we still have to live this life on earth. He doesn't save us and then automatically take us to heaven. There's an assignment, there's a purpose, there's a plan, there's a destiny that he has for us to fulfill on this earth. And the enemy knows that. So the enemy is going to keep sending those same tactics, those same tricks, those same mentalities, those same strongholds to you. But when Jesus saves you and delivers you, there comes a point where you have to allow him to be Lord so that that salvation, sanctification and deliverance can truly take place. You're saying, God, I, I'm still struggling. I, I still feel bound by this addiction. I thought you saved me from this. I did. But in order to experience that salvation, I told you to throw those cigarettes away and to throw those magazines away and to get rid of uh, those things that cause you to fall back into some of the things that you're bound by. That's the part where, where Jesus is Lord. That's where you have to allow him to be Lord. If, if, if Jesus tells you by the Holy Spirit to let go of something, to let go of that relationship, to let go of that friend, to let go of that idol, you just, a lot of times we don't want to do it, but we don't recognize that a lot of our freedom and deliverance comes from letting go and allowing Jesus to be Lord. So, like I said, Jesus saved me after that moment, but there are still things I was holding on to. He wasn't my Lord fully. He wasn't my Lord fully after I had that encounter in the park. There were still times where I would go out 
to bars. I was moving differently. I wasn't moving as as hectic as I was before. I was going like, oh, well, I can be a light. I can tell this this testimony to other people. But there would be times where I would uh, take a shot here or, you know, entertain a girl there in Christ, <laughs> in Christ. But there was a shift. And, and, and I'm so thankful for the Lord because, again, he's so gracious. Like he would allow me to experience certain things um, where I remember where I, I fully surrendered to the Lord. I was out at this this little bar and um, I was talking to this girl and it was going well. But in my spirit, I'm like, this is going well by the world standards. I know this girl is not my wife. You know, so, you know, whatever happened, I, I got her Snapchat or whatever. Then I'm leaving. I'm driving home from this this night out. And I'm like, God, this. This is not what this is life is about. This, this is not what this life is about. God, I'm done. I'm done chasing after girls. I'm done trying to fit in with the world. God, like it's me and you. And that moment, I remember that moment. It was last year. Um. I'll say in late December, early January, it was last year that I fully surrendered and allowed Jesus to be my Lord. And from there, like I said, it was it's still a process. It's always going to be a process in this walk, even when you're, uh, you know, older in the faith. There's still things that, you know, the Lord wants to work on. Um, but now I'm like I said, I'm thankful. Like God has opened up doors. He's allowed me to experience um, deliverance. Um, he brought about divine uh, connections and appointments um, that has helped me in my faith and in my walk. He's brought about friends who are saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, who uh, are not just there to have a good time and hang out, but are there to break bread, break down the word, get in times of prayer, get in times of, of you know, you know, godly rebuke. Like, hey, man, like I see you're kind of veering off this way or. I can, you know, what can I do to pray for you kind of thing? Like God's brought about true uh, people uh, of God in my life. And uh, he's allowed me to, you know, just grow spiritually. Um, he's exposed me, like I said, to deliverance, uh, which he kind of forewarned me in my dreams about that. You know, that's something I'll be doing. I've had my own deliverances in my times of prayer in my in my secret place where I would just begin to. You know, either be in the word and something hit me and I begin to uh, manifest and and he's used those times to deliver me and I would feel freedom after it. Um, so, you know, that is a, a pretty much the the whole testimony. You know, there are different details and things that I could go into, but I want, you know, the, the main point of this um, video to be that whatever you're going through, whatever you experienced like God can use it all, right? You know, it says all things work together for the good of those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. So those moments where, you know, I was not living for him, those things were working for my good because I was still called. We're all called. It's just, do we accept the call, you know? And there were moments where I remember, this is one last little thing. I remember one time, like I said, this was after the encounter in the park, I was still in that in-between time where I wasn't fully surrendered. Um, I was out at this little, you know, lounge and, and I was standing, you know, with my friend and we, I was just looking around, um, not really doing anything, just standing around kind of posted up kind of thing. And this um, lady saw me and asked me to come over. And when, when I got over towards her, she like pretty much prophesied to me. Um, she was like, you know, you are a king pretty much. Like you are a, you are a man that is uh, gonna do great things and great exploits. And she didn't say for the kingdom or anything like that, but the word that she gave me was very timely because at that point I was still feeling that, you know, identity uh, issue, that rejection, that feeling of, you know, lack of self-worth. And 
in that moment, God used a, a stranger at a at a lounge where God was not really to be found, but he used a woman to speak into my life. And um, it's crazy, you know, how God can use, you know, different things um, and experiences that we wouldn't expect him to use to get us back on track. And so that's my encouragement for everybody. Like, hey, you may be um, not living right or you may be feeling God's far away. You may have gone through things that weren't your doing. Um, but God can use those things and heal you from those things. Um, and he wants he wants to go on that journey with you. A lot of times we don't want to go on the journey. We just want the freedom and the healing and the deliverance and the purpose and the destiny and all of that right away. But it's a process. And when you get in the word and you get in prayer, um, that's when you begin to see, you know, everything for what it is, everything that God has done for us on the cross and all the gems and all the principles that he's given us in our in, in his word to apply. Because a lot of times, you know, we hear a word, but we don't do it. Um, and when we start doing it, like I, like I said, kind of in, in line with Christ being Lord, when we start to do the things that he has given us in his word, we'll start to see freedom. So um, this video is kind of long, but I'm thankful for um, everybody who stuck it through this far. And, you know, I want to encourage um, everybody that your testimony is real. It matters. And don't feel like your testimony is too small. If you haven't gone through so, you know, we, so many of these you know crazy, hectic things. And don't feel like your testimony or the things that you went through are too drastic that people will judge you for the things that you've done in your past. Um, you know, when we when we give our life to Christ, you know, everything in the past, you know, uh, be becomes, you know, pretty much null and void. Every identity that we aligned with or yoked ourselves with before Christ is is no longer valid. Um and the things that we've experienced is the wounds, the uh, the brokenness that we, you know, cause ourselves or others may have caused us before Christ. He's there to heal those things. So um, I thank you guys for watching this video and I hope it has blessed you. Um, and I, I look forward to uh, making, you know, more videos for you guys in the future. Please like, comment, share and subscribe on this video. And I'm praying that God bless every one of you. Peace. Have a good one.